Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, I want to welcome everyone to this session of the Weatherhead Forum. So the Weatherhead Forum is a regular meeting that showcases the research of the various units and affiliate of the Weatherhead uh, Center for International Affairs. But this year, we've also decided to host several uh, special sessions on big topics, big urgent topics. And of course, today's topic is extremely uh, timely especially as we now have a new administration in place in the US, which hopefully is opening a lot of uh, room for new possibilities. So the topic is progress, challenges, and opportunities for sustainability research. And we are extremely fortunate to have a leading team of uh, world expert to help us, uh, to guide us in our, as we uh, learn about new development and the frontier of sustainability research, which is, really a booming field that is extremely well represented here at Harvard. So we have several speakers, uh, each of them will speak uh, for uh, 15 minutes or so. So we're going to start with Carl Folke, who is a friend of mine and the chair of the board of the Stockholm Resilience Center. And he's also the director of the Belger Institute for Ecological Economics at the Royal Swedish Academy of Science. Is a transdisciplinary environmental scientist and uh, is at the center of an amazing global uh, network of experts on sustainability. They are doing amazing work in particular on the management of uh, plastics in the ocean that uh, as involved coordinating with uh, various countries to make sure that uh, the leading uh, companies that are creating uh, pollution in the ocean are in the, in the fishing industry and are managing the plastic are able to coordinate their work. So his current work on which actually I've collaborated some is a white paper for the first Nobel Prize Summit to be held um, in April uh, 21. And the title of uh, this white paper is Our Future in the Anthropocene Biosphere, Global Sustainability and Resilient Societies. Our, our second speaker is our own uh, Bill Clark, who is the Harvey Brooks a Professor of International Science, Public Policy and Human Development at the Kennedy School. He served as a member of the Executive Committee of the Weatherhead Center for several years. He currently co-chairs um, the Sustainability Plan Subcommittee of uh, the Presidential Committee on Sustainability at Harvard. So hopefully he'll help us see the way forward as we're thinking about the uh, issues ahead of us. Uh, he also directs the sustainability science program, is extremely active uh, in setting the agenda for the field. And along with uh, Alicia Hartley, another panelist who will speak today, he recently produced a wonderfully comprehensive review of recent research on sustainable development. And he co-organized uh, with uh, Pamela Madsen at Stanford, a follow-up workshop of the National Academy of Science to explore cutting edge research on themes identified in the review. So here we're really talking about scientific agenda setting about for the field of sustainability uh, at the, in the US, but also far beyond. And Alicia Hartley is someone that the Weatherhead Center uh, likes to call one of our own because she was a graduate student associate at the center for a few years, but she's now the Giorgio Ruffolo Postdoctoral Research Fellow in Sustainability Science at the Kennedy School, where she's also a lecturer in environmental science and public policy uh, uh, for Harvard College. And her research looks at the way in which institutions shape development pathways in intertwined uh, nature society system and how actors can orient institution to meet sustainability goals, especially around issues of equity and access. So as mentioned earlier with Bill, she has produced this very comprehensive review on uh, research on sustainability uh, development. Then we have Dustin Tangley, who is a professor in the Department of Government at Harvard. His office is very close to the Weatherhead. And he's also deputy vice provost for advances in learning 
uh, at the university. The Weatherhead has funded for a few years an interdisciplinary initiative on sustainability in which he was very, very centrally involved with David Keat of the Kennedy School. And he uh, really brought in the uh, political science perspective on how uh, collective decisions are reached uh, to benefit uh, large numbers. And he's now launching a very important uh, initiative at uh, Harvard uh, called the Climate Pipeline Project, uh, which is about training graduate students in the field. And he will discuss this today. And he will also speak briefly about a different project that he's directing this summer with the Harvard Center for Public Services and Engaged Scholarship. Uh, and finally, uh, we will have at the end Bob Cohen, uh, who uh, is Professor of International Affairs at uh, Emeritus at Princeton. He was uh, the Stanley Professor of International Peace in the Department of Government at Harvard from 85 to 96. So many of us consider him a dear colleague. Not me, I was not here then, but all people who were in the government department at the time certainly remind him, remember him very fondly. He recently moved back to the Boston area and he's uh, again, faculty associate of the Weatherhead Center. So we're delighted to have him with us. He gave one of our most prestigious lectures in 2016, the Manchel Lecture in American Foreign Policy. And I should mention also that in 2012, he received the Harvard Centennial Medal from the graduate, uh, the GSAS, which is one of the highest honor that Harvard gives to its uh, PhDs. And he's been involved in the National Academy of Science workshop that uh, uh, Bill organized, and he's on the steering uh, committee of the Climate Pipeline Project that uh, Dustin is, is heading. So he will offer some final words on the topic. So we're going to proceed starting with Carl, who will talk about the Anthropocene rep uh, report. And then uh, after all the presentations, we're going to have a little exchange among panelists. I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll open it up to, uh, to the audience for a Q&A. And uh, you can simply put your questions in the Q&A, and we'll, we'll read them and engage the audience. So Carl, the, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, Michelle. Very, very super nice to be with you all. And uh, I try to share my screen here. Okay, for some reason it's not, I see if I can get it, it seems to not work perfectly, just a second. Now, um, this is a thin layer around our planet called the biosphere, and I guess you were familiar with it because it's, it's our home. Uh, it's about 20 kilometers, and that's where we as people have developed and evolved, and, uh, and we're, we're embedded in it. Uh, I, I start with this point of view. Uh, I start with this point because um, uh, often when we talk about sustainability, we talk about three legs of sustainability, societal, economic, or environmental. But the point here is that they are all highly interconnected, and embedded in this biosphere that we're part of. And the biosphere is then, of course, interacting with the rest of the planet and, and shaping the living conditions for us and other, and other life on Earth. What has happened now in the last, especially since the Second World War, but, but a little bit more than that, is that uh, our species ha has become a very dominant actor in the biosphere. And I guess you all are aware of that. And some people are calling that uh, phase now the end Anthropocene, where, where the scale, connectivity, speed and spread of our actions are now shaping the planet, not just locally or where we live, but also at the global level. And uh, things like climate change and changes in biodiversity and these type of efforts, issues are, are now uh, symptoms of this type of scale increase. To, to give you an example, if we compare the weight of us humans on Earth with uh, the weight of all wild mammals on earth. Our weight is about 10 times bigger. And if we add the weight, our weight to the weight of all the livestock and all the other 
mammals that we produce to eat. That together is about 96% of the weight of all mammals on Earth. So it's only 4% that are wild mammals today. Another example of this uh, scale increase is the, is the mass that we are now turning around more mass as people than what we have as biomass of everything living on Earth. So, so we are in a new, in a new space, a fairly new place, and, and uh, which we tend to call an intertwined system of people and nature. It's not just people linked to nature, but it's really, it's really intertwined and interconnected, and not just locally, but across all scales. And, and this interconnection is embedded, embedded in uh, the biosphere. Two critical dimensions of the, of the Anthropocene is, of course, the new risk uh, or new turbulence or shock environment that is a, is a result of these interactions uh, that interact now not just as a climate issue or a social issue, but, but together actually in new ways. And that's a whole emerging research field called Anthropocene risk or global risk or, or, or synchronic risks and synchronic failures. Uh, on the other hand, we have we have also found that there are uh, another key dimension of, of this expansion is the simplification of, of uh, the Earth's ecosystem through production of single resources that we really demand in society. So these type of phenomena, the, the, the shock and risks and surprise dimension combined with the simplification leads to more turbulent times than, than we are, have had earlier on and less stable situations than we had earlier on, actually. And that leads me to the research field that I've been working very much is social ecological systems and resilience thinking. And we really look at how periods of slow change or gradual change interact with these type of sudden shocks or surprises. And, and what type of capacities uh, people have to persist or adapt to these changes or even transform into new pathways when they are confronted with change. And we have a lot of case studies actually going on in, in, in the real world that, where that has happened, these type of shifts, not just uh, persisting or adapting, but actually transforming into new ways of doing things. Uh, and this is an extremely simplified view of that. Uh, what we found in the many cases we looked at, we looked at cases from local landscapes in Sweden to, to stewardship of the whole Great Barrier Reef in Australia, to, to the management, uh, to the global governance actually of, of uh, the Southern Ocean's fisheries resources, and a lot, lot of other case studies. And what we found is that there are often a phase of preparing for change, um, and, and that uh, preparation uh, often goes nowhere because uh, the other levels of governance uh, are or too robust or, or, or there's not enough space to change things. But suddenly there's a window open, opening up, a window of opportunity where that prepared system can, can move into a, a new state or a new pathway. And, and that's where you need navigation of the transition and then to, to build resilience of the new pathway that you're on. And, and, and this is a combination of agency, a lot of actors, uh, policy entrepreneurs, institutional entrepreneurs or other concepts that people are using. Uh, interacting with the different different social net networks, combining them in new ways, and uh, out of that often new forms of organizations emerges. We call them bridging organizations. I know that Bill and his team has called it boundary organizations, and uh, and uh, that can happen within existing institutions or new norms and rules may be formed, and and uh, and, and there's a lot of a lot of much more complex complex dynamics around it, which to some extent is illustrated in this uh, really rich picture. Uh, basically uh, a combination of the work we've been doing with the work on, on a whole group called social technical transitions with lots of people working on social innovation. Looking at these seeds to the, in the left corner, how they, can, how they can emerge and what conditions that it takes for them to scale up and, and really shift uh, patterns at more systemic levels. So that is sort of a lot of work being done on, on, on um, these type of uh, complex adaptive systems dynamics, you could say, where, where the actors 
interact to form new pat patterns and then these patterns feed back on the actors. But we were also interested in looking at leverage points and that was something that Michelle mentioned in the introduction to see whether there are shortcuts to, to transform uh, current ways of doing into, into more sustainable pathways that are in line with the way the biosphere operates. So we, we asked the question whether there could be critical actors who not only sort of run the global system and, the, and are influencing the global economy, but are actually shaping the, the, the biosphere uh, in, in a major way. And we started with the ocean and found that there were 13 companies there that, that are, are really shaping the ocean ecosystem through, through sea food production. And now we have started to work uh, with those, uh, those companies actually. Uh, we work with uh, uh, 10 of them, three Japanese, two Thai companies, one South Korean and, uh, and the Norwegian salmon producers and also uh, fish meal producers. Uh, companies like Cargill, for example, have a big section on fish meal that, that are part of this collaboration. And, and the idea here is to shift the rural activity from uh, looking at themselves as producing, of, uh, producing a commodity to to uh, looking through the whole supply chain, uh, chains uh, to make them transparent and uh, have traceability, but even further to shift, transform the whole sector into, into stewardship of the oceans uh, with the recognition that uh, it won't be easy to do sustainable and healthy seafood if the oceans are not healthy and sustainable. And, and, and that's an initiative that has spilled over now into lots of other uh, arenas, like the high level panel for ocean sustainable economy that Jane Lubchenko to the right down there in the picture led, um, uh, which was presented in December and uh, several other initiatives in the, for example, in the UN Global Compact and these type of things. So, so for us, this has been a leverage point of of sort of massaging the top top down to, to have cascading effects throughout the whole sector, combined with the emergence from uh, lower levels also for transformations. And, and as uh, Michelle mentioned, uh, there is a white paper, Our Future in the Anthropocene Biosphere, which you can find on the webpage of this, uh, of the Nobel Prize uh, Summit. And uh, actually in a couple of weeks, there will be a shorter version published in AMBU, which is a journal of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and also a three-page summary of, of, of what I've been talking about today in much more depth. So finally then, I would just like to emphasize some of the points that I tried to made, make here in this uh, fast speed and uh, over, over the Atlantic Ocean, is uh, basically to really understand that people are part of the planet and not and not uh, the, the, that the environment is something separate that is an external thing to society. But now we are completely intertwined with it actually. And, and it's not about the future of the environment or saving the environment. It's of course, it's really about our own future on this little round ball that is at stake right now. And, and uh, it's global social ecological change uh, where climate change is a subset of that. And, and um, Strengthening the resilience of the whole planet's biosphere that we're embedded in is, of course, critical for our own development, well being, and health. And therefore, we need to have transformations towards global sustainability. It's not just necessary, but it's absolutely possible and it's highly desirable if we want to talk about a good future for humanity on this earth for long into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carl. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for starting the conversation. Now we're going to turn to our own Bill Clark. Okay. Thank you very much, Michelle. I'm delighted to be here with the group in my uh, one time and future stomping grounds of, of the Weatherhead Center. Um, the, the task we decided to uh, allocate to me today um, is to provide a sense of the research still needed to flesh out uh, the big picture provided by Carl's opening presentation of sustainability. Uh, it's what we might call its discontents uh, and its future prospects. Um, so 
to frame that, um, let me begin just by reminding us about the, the normative side of sustainability. That is what by now a uh, decade long global political process has decided uh, is, a, is, an, is a goal we're trying to reach as humanity. Um, it is, still has one of its canonical statements in the uh, Brundtland Commission of 1987. Um, environment is where we live. Uh, development is what we all do in seeking to approve, improve our lots within that abode, um, that, uh, that humanity has, they said with uh, a certain amount of good faith, uh, uh, the ability to make development sustainable, to ensure it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So a strong equity focus. But the question remained of how what's needed still from the research community to provide ammunition, uh, as Carl talked about, leverage points to those on the front line of sustainable development activism uh, to move things forward. And what I'll try to do is summarize some of those most exciting research horizons um, in the next eight slides or so uh, coming from the uh, both review paper with my colleague Alicia Harley and the National Academies workshop that uh, that Michelle referred to earlier. So um, let me start. Um, nature and society are increasingly intertwined in a co-evolving system. Uh, Carl made this point uh, unequivocally. Um, the co-evolution relevant to sustainable development is that which occurs over multiple generations. Research to date, I would argue, has largely been focused on the shorter term, regulating fisheries, uh, costing carbon, uh, inventing greener chemistry and so forth. Looking forward, it seems that the challenge to research is to better engage long durée histories of, co of these co-evolving pathways of development. We need to do that in order both to challenge our theories, to prod them and to test them. The theory will have claims, the theories of sustainability will have claims to be taken seriously when it can better explain the patterns of interaction between nature and society that have been documented in such long durée studies as Bill Cronin's Nature's Metropolis or our own Sven Beckert's uh, The Empire of Cotton. Uh, until, th until then, one might argue we have interesting theory, but we really haven't run it off across long run data sets with enough complexity to challenge that theory. Okay, so second big area of research needs, oops. <laughs> uh, concerns the goals of sustainable development. Um, goals merit careful attention of any science seeking solutions to social problems. And as noted earlier, a globally shared goal for sustainable development has emerged through repeated rounds of social deliberation over the last 30 plus years. Its essence is that development should be fair or equitable, aiming to improve the well-being of people in the here and now, but doing so in ways that do not unfairly jeopardize the ability of people elsewhere or in the future to improve their own well-being, like by dumping our junk in their backyards. That said, comparative and historical studies of development show us that the particular constituents of well-being that a people most want to improve vary strongly in context across space and time. Therefore, a major research challenge focusing sustainability science uh, is to craft and evaluate solutions that do not assume solutions in the here and now, that do not assume that our grandchildren or our neighbors will value the same constituents as well-being as we have now. So this balancing of tension of deference to local rights and, and preferences against the need for an overarching long-term stable goal to bring us forward. Okay. Third area of, uh, of sustainability research. Um, as Carl alluded to, resources and people's access to them have proven a useful way of thinking about the ultimate determinants of well being and thus of sustainable development. That said, it's become increasingly clear that a narrow view of what constitutes relevant constituents, uh, for example, a view restricted to marketed goods and services included in calculations like GNP 
will mislead long run efforts to pursue sustainable development. Sustainability science research has shown the value of taking a broad and inclusive view of resources that contribute to human well being, a view that includes not only uh, the more traditional anthropogenic resources, human capital, manufactured capital, social capital, and knowledge capital, but also natural resources such as minerals, ecosystems, and climate. Challenges remain, however, in determining how sustainability assessment should assess, address the presumptively partial substitutability and trade offs among these resources. Crucially, uh, how much nature we need to keep, how much we need to conserve versus how much nature in what context is it worth converting or degrading uh, in order to produce uh, improvements in other aspects of the resource base that build social well-being. Uh, cutting down the first hectare of forest in Cronin's New England to build the first schoolhouse was almost, almost certainly a good sacrifice of natural capital. Cutting down the last hectare of old growth forest in New England uh, in order to build another parking lot for Walmarts is almost certainly a bad use of capital, but getting those uh, trade-offs right and analytically tractable uh, remains a major challenge for the field. Okay, then on to my, oops, fourth of eight research horizons. Um, Research has shown that the uh, old formulation of production consumption relationships um, are indeed a powerful lens for understanding how the potential of resources to support the goals of social well being is actually realized in practice. Too much research, however, has continued to focus only on the production or only on the consumption end of this spectrum of this system. And a result has provided incomplete or even distorted understanding of what shapes and can guide uh, long-term development pathways. In current parlance, perhaps, production of vaccines doesn't prevent infection, only the consumption of vaccination does. So looking ahead to the research community, we need more integrated research on consumption production relationships or systems, exploring both how consumption demands are shaped and in turn shape production activities, but reciprocally how new production possibilities can change patterns of consumption demand, not least because people invest in advertising to make that happen. Um, an example worth emulating in other sectors is the trend of energy service providers to explore both the supply, the production, new sources of energy, and the demand, consumption and conservation options uh, for reducing their use of key resources. Okay, um, moving on to my number five. Um, governance is clearly required in order that these production consumption arrangements advance well being equitably in the pursuit of sustainability rather than settling for some neoliberal hellscape in which a very few sequester benefits to themselves in the here and now to the detriment of many elsewhere or in the future. Research in sustainability science has been frankly slow in coming to understand that governance involves not just the rules you would like to be there, but those institutions, rules and norms, plus the actors who shape those institutions plus the relative power of some of those actors over others to control their benefit, their beliefs and behaviors. I'll leave the discussion of research frontiers in sustainability governance to later panelists in today's forum who are vastly better equipped uh, and qualified to uh, discuss them than I. Here, I'll only note that sustainability researchers themselves are belatedly rediscovering that indeed knowledge is power. That is, the knowledge we produce as researchers empowers some people and disempowers others. In particular, we now understand that one of the many ways in which a few actors accumulate disproportionate power over others is quite literally through their influence on what questions scientists asks, what evidence is made available, and who has meaningful access to the research results versus who can get through at them only when they can penetrate paywalls or patents and the like. Um, researchers then sadly have become 
too easily complicit, even if unconsciously so, in reinforcing existing power inequities together with the agendas and interests of the powerful. So given the centrality of equity to sustainable development goals, we sustainability researchers need looking forward to take special care to reflect on whose agendas our work is serving, whose power it is enhancing, and what our research can do to empower those who are unfairly losing out on current development pathways. Okay, on to number six, what, six of eight. Um, six of eight is recognizing that most sustainability research has focused on specific places or sectors in proper recognition of the context dependence of nature society interactions and their governance. So we study energy sector provision in Europe or the farming systems of uh, Borneo uh, and so on and so on. Uh, basically that's a sensible bounding research approach. But too often it has led us to forget that in the practical world out there of advancing sustainability, other places and sectors are going on with their development at the same time. Connections among these sites may nonetheless exist and may be important for our understanding, but most sustainability studies still ignore them. Now, we're beginning to make progress in this area. You hear more about nexus studies looking at how uh, development of a water sector and an energy sector and an agricultural sector uh, all end up depending on the same sources of water uh, for their success. Uh, there's some, some absolutely incredibly exciting work on teleconnections in the geophysical system. And there's uh, increasing analysis of extended networks among actors um, that work across national borders and so on. That said, sustainability research still needs to be asking more systematically whose resources particular places or sectors are acquiring where particular places or sectors are sending their junk, and whether those and other neighborly connections are established in a fair and equitable manner, uh, and where in our neighborhood of issues and actors, we can find the allies for the hard collective work of pursuing sustainability, not just in one place and one sector as though they existed in isolation, but recognizing that unless we build joint commitments and partnerships, Gov building governance relationships and institutions moving forward uh, is going to be extremely problematical. Uh, so, ooh, I did it. God, I don't control this thing. Okay, next to last. Um, as Carl emphasized in his opening presentation, nature society interactions we've come to understand are quite literally complex adaptive systems. That is, they're characterized by persistent heterogeneity or diversity on by local but incomplete connections among things going on in particular places, what I just referred to, and crucially by autonomous selection problems by which features of some of these localities, the innovations in governance or in technologies going on within them, get greater replication or spread than others. Um, this is becoming an easier point to make in the time of COVID than we wish. Um, these processes, therefore, include not only the natural selection we are seeing in the emergence of coronavirus variants, but also what we see as venture capitalists trying to discover, select, and propagate their own unicorns. These fundamental characteristics of complex nature society interactions yield then a set of properties that most research in the field is only beginning to seriously address. Um, the first is the hierarchical structure of these nature society systems that we're trying to nudge towards sustainability. Um, the second is the utterly fundamental role of the perpetual generation of novelty and innovations at the micro scale in particular contexts and the mediation of selection processes for which of those novelties and innovations will go viral at the meso scale, sometimes mediated by macro level trends like climate warming, undermining dominant nodes of agricultural production at the meso scale, and therefore providing open in niches for local innovations in green agriculture or vertical farming or whatever. This centrality of uh, innovation and the notion that innovations 
are invested in, emerge, and mature over decadal time spans is probably the weakest link in sustainability research today that too often imagines a world going forward with the same technologies, plus or minus a few points in efficiency, or the same political institutions uh, as we're stuck with today. For as all history tells us that over periods of decades and more, that is highly unlikely to be true. So the last comment then is that this results in dynamic, this complex adaptive system results in dynamics that Carl pointed out in his introduction that are far from equilibrium, uh, that is far from equilibrium behavior, unstable equilibrium behavior is the rule, not the, not the uh, exception, that these pathways of development are path dependent but capable of inhabiting multiple regimes. You can build an energy system around fossil fuels, or you can build an energy system around renewables, and they build different empowerments of people, different institutions, different technologies, and the like. These regimes, as Carl pointed out, are separated by thresholds that can be crossed, sometimes due to external shocks, sometimes due to intentional transformative interventions. And the challenge facing us as Oh, I did it again. Someday I'll get good at this, right? Um, the challenge facing us as researchers is certainly to continue to work to help assess which pathways of development are more likely to lead to equitable improvements in human well being within and between generations. But we also need to acknowledge more than we've done in, say, the IPCC scenarios that behavior of these complex adaptive systems that we inhabit in the Anthropocene can never, never be fully forecast or controlled, both because they're so complicated, but centrally because they are innovation generators. We therefore need to build, learn to build operational capacity for dynamically guiding those pathways towards sustainability in the face of the inevitable shocks, surprises, and scientific forecasting blunders that are surely going to come along. The challenge of building operational capacity for sustainable development uh, is fortunately the focus of our next panelist, uh, my colleague Alicia Harley, uh, and therefore I can stop talking. In the slides that are posted uh, in, I suppose by the Weatherhead Center in the wake of this. Uh, there's one additional slide in this set that gives you sources of information I used in the talk and how to get in touch uh, with me or Dr. Harley if you want to howl in outrage about what we said. Thank you very much. This is great. Thank you so much, Bill. Extremely, extremely uh, inspiring and useful. Uh, now we're going to turn to Alicia, but I also want to remind our audience that if you have questions, you can push them in the Q&A and we'll get to them a little bit later. Thank you. So Alicia, the Zoom is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me just quickly share my screen. Wonderful. All right, well, thank you so much to Michelle and the Weatherhead Center for having me today and for hosting uh, this uh, very topical discussion now at a moment coming maybe uh, to the other end of COVID where I think we're all thinking about how do we move forward in a sustainable direction and how do we develop the capacities uh, to enable our societies to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So this talk uh, very much builds off of the talk of my colleague, Bill Clark, who went right before me. Um, and it is sort of the second half of this long paper. We just published an annual review of environment and resources. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out if you're interested. Moving right from what Bill was just saying, I think if the central challenge of sustainability that Brundtland and the Brundtland Commission put before us and said we could do, which was both to ensure equity for current and for future generations, the central finding of research of, of nature society interactions of fundamental research and also applied sustainability science research over the past couple of decades that both Carl and Bill alluded to is this idea that the Anthropocene system is very complex and uncertain. That you see far from equilibrium dynamics uh, in all sorts of places. You see path dependencies uh, and you can tell that, or and we're very clear that 
are development pathways. They're both stuck in a single regime, but they're also capable of moving into alternative regimes that can lead to both declining worse human well-being than we have today, or alternatively, hopefully, we hope there are other development pathway regimes out there that can lead to better uh, lives for ourselves, more equitable lives across this generation, and also for future generations. But at its heart, the Anthropocene system in which we live exhibits this fundamental uncertainty and is uh, subject to huge shocks and surprises, whether they're kind of expected, like those of climate change coming down the way, or more unexpected, like uh, the COVID uh, virus we've just seen and in its impacts on well-being, both of people, of people around the world. So I think the implication of the sort of uncertainty in the Anthropocene system is that pathways of development cannot be fully predicted or predicted or high, hardwired in ways that assure sustainability. In other words, we can't come up with one plan today and know that it's gonna promote sustainability over the long durée. Instead, what we argue is that because pathways of development are so uncertain, we actually need a set of not just what do we do, not just rules, but operational capacities in our societies, in our governance systems, in order to promote sustainability in the face of shocks and surprises. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about six such operational capacities uh, that have emerged as foci of sustainability science research across multiple different research programs uh, around, around the world really uh, that contribute uh, to the growing field of sustainability science. There are probably more capacities out there, uh, but these are the ones we focus on. As I go through this, I encourage you to think about a system of your own that you're interested in, uh, whether it's a regional system or a, or a sector, uh, and how these capacities might play out there. Are the capacities currently strong? Are they weak? Who has more of them? And, and what could we do to make them stronger uh, as we move forward? So uh, uh, the graph to the right or the, the image to the right uh, shows the six capacities I'll go through, but they are the capacity to measure progress, uh, the capacity to promote equity, the capacity to adapt to shocks and surprises, but also the capacity to transform development pathways, the capacity to link knowledge with action, and the capacity to govern uh, cooperatively. Although I'll say less about that one because I'm pretty sure Bob uh, Cohen coming after me can do that, can do more justice to that than I ever could. So moving uh, to the capacity to measure, what, what a, a huge challenge for sustainability science over the past couple of decades has been a need for a consistent and logically coherent way to evaluate whether the development trajectories we're currently on are sustainable or aren't they? And, and whether proposed interventions will make things more sustainable or won't. Uh, and until recently, until the last half decade, decade, we really have had a sort of hodgepodge approach to our ability to measure this and different metrics and sometimes just the dog's breakfast and difficulty saying, yes, this is a sustainable uh, pathway for my region, my state, my country, uh, and this isn't. Uh, I would say that that's changing quickly. Uh, we now recognize, uh, thanks to work largely uh, in resource economics, that focusing and, and asset management that we need to focus on the resources or the fuel in the tank that can tell us something not only about who has access to those resources today, but whether resources are being sustained that, so that future generations can pursue their own definitions of the good life. And Bill talked a little bit about these resources as well, but they're, they include both the natural capital asset stocks that we think about, so ecosystems, minerals, uh, the way our climate system functions, but also uh, anthropogenic assets like social capital, knowledge capital, human capital, manufactured capital. But really we want to make sure that those resources are both equitably distributed today, but being passed on to future generations as well, so they can pursue their own view of the good life. There's a growing research program on uh, this approach, which is usually referred to as the inclusive wealth, um, and it uses economics basically to measure wealth defined by access to resource stocks. 
uh, and looks at the complex trade-offs that Bill also alluded to between cutting down the first hectare of forest uh, to help someone build a road to get to the hospital versus the last hectare of forest for yet one more parking lot. And how do you decide, well, which unit of road actually increases our overall being, overall well-being versus decreases it? So the second capacity I wanted to talk about is the capacity to promote equity. The Brundtland Commission uh, really put equity squarely at the center of the sustainability agenda. They noted both that we had the capacity to protect the needs of future generations, ensure they could meet their own definitions of the good life, but also think about equity intragenerational equity within this generation uh, and, and put more effort into making sure everyone alive today also had better access to both their basic needs being met, but also ability to pursue their own aspirations. Yet despite the centrality of equity to the founding of uh, the sustainable development agenda, a lot of our research and certainly some of our programs and implementing efforts have really failed to focus either on inter or intra-generational equity and sometimes even both. I think what's really amazing today is if you look at the 17 uh, sustainable development goals uh, and carefully look through the targets, you'll note that really none of them squarely take into account intergenerational equity issues. They're quite focused on intragenerational equities, which is a great thing, but they just totally leave out, well, how do we think about, are we actually leaving to future generations uh, what they need to have to be able to pursue uh, their own well-being? Um, so finally, it's really clear that inequality is an emergent property of any complex nature society system. And a lot of research in sustainability science has borne that out. But the problem with inequality, and I think this is really important in noting, is that inequality in access to resources leads to inequities in power and in turn reduces the ability of all but the most powerful actors to define and pursue their own goals. So for sustainability science research and for building this capacity to promote equity, we have to think hard both about how do we protect future generations and build into our laws and norms an ethos of passing resources on to future generations, but also how do we uh, protect people within this current generation and how do we need to change our rules and norms and laws to do that better. Uh, finally, or not finally, sorry, number three, uh, the capacity to adapt to shocks. So I think arising fundamentally out of this uncertainty in the Anthropocene system is this need to be able to adapt to shocks. We've clearly just seen that over the last year. And the better we are at adapting to shocks, the more able we are to conserve the well-being of a people alive today. Um, one thing that is very clear out of the literature on adaptation is that adaptation often fails to reduce the overall risk in the system, but instead often redistributes that risk towards more vulnerable groups. So as we think about, well, can we adapt to different situations? We need to think also going back to the capacity to promote equity about the equity dimensions of that. Heterogeneity is also a really important concept when it comes to thinking about equity. The capacity, our own capacity to adapt often rests on our ability to innovate and find new ways of doing things from elsewhere. So to connect with other people and places and bring in new ways when the current way we're doing things turns out not to be working. And finally, as I said earlier, when you have uh, a system that really leads to increased vulnerability uh, for the most vulnerable. You know that multiple trade-offs exist in how you redistribute risk and adaptive capacity, and we have to focus on the most vulnerable populations. Sorry, that's a bit of a repeat as we, as we build our capacity to adapt to shocks and surprises. But the flip side of needing to adapt to shocks and surprises here today uh, for vulnerable populations, for all of us, is that sometimes, and I've seen this repeatedly sort of with government organizations that are focused on the ability to adapt, is that we get so concerned about our ability to adapt today that we ignore the necessity of some systems. They're just, adapting will never be enough. 
there's a requirement that we not just adapt, but we transform uh, the pathway of development uh, that we're on completely onto a very different and new regime. And oftentimes these two concepts, sort of adaptive capacity and transformative capacity are linked together under the general heading of resilience scholarship. Uh, and increasingly in resilience scholarship, people are taking these two ideas apart where they're saying, okay, we, there's some component that is about adaptive capacity and another component that's about transformative capacity. But being really clear, I think in identifying, well, is this system, do we need to just adapt around the edges and that will allow us to sort of continue to increase our well-being, or do we actually fundamentally need to transform? It's a very important question to ask about any system. And that's why I think it's really important to distinguish between adaptive and transformative capacity in our scholarship and our policy advice. Uh, but transformative capacity involves shifts across regime thresholds, resulting in future development pathways that are qualitatively completely different from the ones we're on. Uh, and it, it requires much larger shifts from equilibrium uh, that in social systems and technological systems and in the environmental systems at play. Uh, these shifts often require sort of huge changes in power structures and thus there's huge barriers both to transformation, both in terms of sort of the technological capacity, uh, path dependence of returns to scale, but also powerful actors interested in blocking the change changes uh, towards more transformational development pathways. Uh, what we found in the literature over uh, the past decade, looking hard at how do we how do we promote transformations, is that innovation plays a major role, but also anticipatory assessments. Can we think through what which systems need to radically change. And finally, the role of imagination and bringing people together to really imagine a substantially different futures. Uh, it's often said that like you can't, uh, you can't do what you can't dream. And so uh, the ability to allow us collectively to come together and imagine radically different uh, futures has been a central theme of research on transformations. Uh, finally, the capacity, or not, I keep thinking I'm done. Fifth, uh, the capacity to link knowledge with action. So for a long time in sustainability science, we've known that knowledge is probably important to getting all of this work done, but there's been huge questions of how, how do we link this research that's being done uh, around the world uh, to action, whether it's the problem is it just sits in the laboratory or maybe the research that was done here in this place might be really valuable somewhere else, but only if tweaked a little bit to local context, but how do we play that bridging role? There's been a lot of really good research done on this question of linking knowledge with action. I think what we find is that knowledge really needs to be trustworthy, uh, which means it needs to be salient, credible, and legitimate to the people who are gonna consume it. It therefore really matters who participates and shapes knowledge making processes. Uh, so you can't just sort of give knowledge somewhere and expect people to adopt it, uh, as we all know, but, but figuring out the right mix of participation uh, in participation uh, and co-production in knowledge making is critical to its success. So what questions are asked or not asked, whose evidence is considered, and which, which sorts of explanations carry weight are critical to understanding the dilemmas of linking knowledge with action uh, and to ensuring that sort of prevailing institutions and power structures aren't overly influencing where we're going um, for uh, linking knowledge with action. Okay, and then finally, the capacity uh, to govern cooperatively. Uh, and this, as I said, I'll say the least about because Bob uh, Cohen will have more to say, I think, about governance and sustainable development. But in my view, there's sort of three things we really need to focus on uh, when we're thinking about the capacity to govern cooperatively. Uh, one of them I've talked about already, which is our our, our capacity to nurture shared resources. How do we collectively ensure that we're able to measure, track, and ensure that we're conserving and providing equitable access to both natural and anthropogenic assets for current and future generations? Then the second is how do we promote equity? How do our, how do our governance systems really bake into their rules, norms, laws, both concerns around inter and intragenerational equity? Uh, and the final thing is 
around this fundamental uncertainty that I started with, but how do governance systems really play this tightrope between the need to adapt and the need to transform and ensure that sort of whatever group is working on a specific problem isn't so tied to their adaptation solutions that they miss the sort of, that they miss the signs that really the system needs to absolutely transform uh, if we're not gonna sort of dive off of, a, of an unexpected cliff in the future uh, towards rapidly decreasing human well-being. Uh, so those are the six capacities that we identified, uh, Bill and I, in, in our own work on sustainability science. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that the advantage of the capacities approach uh, to thinking about, well, what do we need to do for sustainability, sustainable development, is that society already has a substantial understanding of how to foster each of these capacities, uh, but we certainly still do need more research. Uh, but even as we conduct this research uh, into what, what, what works and what doesn't work in terms of fostering each of these capacities, uh, they can, we can get started. We can integrate them uh, in our governance systems and within societies to better promote sustainability. Uh, so lastly, I will just say uh, we have a collaborative website up these days uh, where we really encourage others to comment on, on this work uh, and engage with it. It's at this URL, www.sustainabilityscience.org. Uh, and you can also contact me uh, to, to uh, ask questions or scream about what I got wrong. Thank you so much. This is terrific, Alicia. I really like the idea that since we cannot control uncertainty, the best we can do is develop capabilities of various kinds. So we'll come back to that, I'm sure, in the Q&A. So now we're going to turn to Dustin uh, Tingley, who will tell us about this pipeline and other projects that he's developing. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. And uh, just wanted to give a um, uh, word of thanks to the Weatherhead Center for um, uh, not only convening this workshop, um, but also all that they do and um, Michelle and others, you know, thanks for, for everything and supporting our community. Um, so I'm Dustin Tingley, I'm a professor of government. I also work in our provost office um, to help uh, advance learning. Um, and so this project is called the Climate Change Pipeline Project, and it's going to be different from some of the previous presentations, but I'm gonna make a pitch to you that this is still about sustainability. Um, so uh, what's the problem? What's the problem we're trying to solve? So um, uh, we know that human-caused climate change is an existential problem that's going to have vast implications for economic, social, um, and political relationships, which then will require innovation. Um, and the decarbonization um, that we think is necessary to um, mitigate some of this is just going to be extremely disruptive of political economies around the world. Um, which will have knock-on effects that are psychological, political, economic, so on and so forth. And it's gonna be difficult for these societies uh, to um, understand how these disruptions um, are going to implicate um, uh, normal functioning and anticipate the barriers that uh, will come up to progress. Um, uh, and so many of which we've already seen. So in some senses then decarbonization provides an extraordinary opportunity for political science as an academic discipline to make a major contribution to public policy and to help ensure that human society continues to, to thrive. Okay, so that's the big problem. But political science has its own problem, um, which is that so far political science has been extremely sluggish to this opportunity, right? We do have scholars that work in this area um, absolutely. Uh, but um, even the most uh, mainstream, uh, Bob Cohane, who's on this uh, webinar, um, who have worked in this area and have tried to catalyze interest um, in others, um, have been frustrated. Uh, there are simply are not many uh, senior faculty um, who systematically work on climate change as a topic. But worse still, our pipeline, and hence our ability to uh, sustain research in this area is also extremely limited. Extremely few PhD students in political science or recent PhD students are doing anything related to climate change. Um, so for example, the Harvard PhD program uh, in government, uh, we have 165 students in our program currently. 
only around three students are doing anything remotely connected to climate. Uh, and that just seems off. I think that seems off to a lot of us on this call, but it also seems off um, to people in the discipline that don't even study climate change. And when I go and talk to my colleagues at other top institutions, Columbia, Princeton, Stanford, Yale, so on and so forth, uh, they say the exact same thing. And in some cases they say that they literally have no students that are studying anything uh, in this area. And that's spanning American politics, international relations and comparative politics, and political philosophy, political theory. Uh, so this is a pipeline problem that we have. And if we hope to uh, have any sustainable uh, research that then can have the impacts that we hope it will, uh, we need to fix that. Um, and so uh, we are thinking about, well, how do you build a pipeline? Okay. Um, and I, I should say that some of this, the, the motivation for this project actually came out of a project that Bob Cohane um, directed about getting young scholars uh, in place to study aspects of climate change vis-a-vis -vis, um, comparative politics, so across countries. Um, and those meetings were incredible because I was getting, as a younger scholar, I was getting to network with others that either I knew a little bit or simply I had never met before. And now those relationships are continuing. Um, but uh, no, I'm already a tenured professor. Um, what we need to do is think about um, the people that are even earlier on in that pipeline. So um, what's our approach? Well, one is that just putting a big spotlight on the topic only goes so far, right? People can yell and scream about, hey, this is an important topic, more people should study it. And that's not gonna do as much as we want it to. So our approach is to identify and target uh, ABDs, so all but dissertation, um, advanced graduate students and assistant professors that are starting to do work on the politics of climate. Have them span across the entirety of political science and make this completely inclusive, not just a sort of international relations compared to politics um, uh, effort, but across the entire uh, breadth. And establish furthermore, a diverse pool of these younger scholars across institutions. So not just simply isolated within the networks that we already have um, in elite IV uh, league institutions. So um, how do you build a pipeline? Well, what we are doing is we're going to pair these young scholars up with each other. And that's really important because we're, we really want to emphasize the kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning rather than something that's top-down. So pair these young scholars up with each other, get them networked with each other, and then also pair them up with established and higher profile senior scholars that are either doing research on climate change politics. So for example, I am doing research on climate change politics now, I didn't used to, um, or they're starting to, okay? So first of all, pair. Then what can we provide? So we can provide professional mentoring, um, and this can come in a range of different forms. So from direct feedback on projects, which then, um, makes it more likely that those projects will land in better journals, which then produces its own uh, process of self-reinforcement. Uh, career coaching, a big question that we get from graduate students is, hey, I want to do work on climate, but I feel like there's not enough appetite out there in the discipline. There are no jobs, et cetera. In fact, that's actually not the case. There are those opportunities. Um, there is a demand. There just isn't as much of a supply. Um, and furthermore, introductions to broader networks in political science, in public policy, um, and even the sciences. Um, and so we've, we've already seen some of that start to happen. We just want to formalize it. And then finally, to create, create a sustainable and replicable model that could be reused and expanded. Indeed, it could be reused, expanded in other disciplines like sociology or economics that have exactly the same problem. This is not just a political science pipeline problem. It's a more general problem. Um, so the mechanics. Okay, so I should say um, we have not launched this in a formal sense in terms of recruiting yet. Uh, we made this proposal and Weatherhead was very uh, generous to support it. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were all lined up. Uh, we had a date, things were a go, um, and then uh, the world went the way it did. Um, so uh, what was what's our plan? Um, we uh, are definitely taking advantage of virtual meetings. Indeed, pre-COVID, we had that as part of it. We had a whole section about how we would use Zoom um, to start to network people together, get them exchanging ideas, get them exchanging projects. Then um, uh, uh, have in-person meetings that are uh, on both sides, right? Um, and so that way people get to meet each other, um, get to network, get to do the things that are just a little bit hard in something like Zoom, okay? 
really trying to emphasize networking across subfields. So not just not letting someone who studies international relations not be aware of all of the things that are happening, say, in American politics. Um, and then having a cross-institutional steering committee with senior faculty. And furthermore, and this is where I'm really excited, given the generosity of the Weatherhead Center in helping us to kick this off, we've been able to get other organizations um, at Harvard and beyond to want to be a part of the project. And so again, that's part of a model to make this sustainable. Um, okay, so this is a little diagram. Um, you know, the Weatherhead Center um, is helping us to kick this off. Okay, so we're gonna change an oil tanker into a, an SUV. Then the Harvard Radcliffe Institute has agreed to fund um, an additional convening. And then we're really thankful that the folks down at Brown University led by um, uh, Jeff Colgan, who's a, a, a graduate student buddy of mine, um, who've just launched the Climate Solutions Lab, they wanna take the ball and run with it too, okay? And so this way we're gonna get to bring in new people, help everyone get networked with each other and really sort of grow and share the range of ideas of possible. Um, so we have a variety of faculty participants within political science. I'm, I'm starring some people that are on our, our steering committee. Um, and this really spans, this is an all-star cast of folks. And it, it spans, and, and so I'm really excited that these folks are, are, are willing to help um, come in and mentor and help these students uh, get on a track where doing work on the politics of climate change um, becomes a mainstream field rather than something that's entirely niche, uh, given the enormity of the problem. Um, so some people, when I describe this project to them, they say, oh, well, why not start earlier? Right? Why are you just focusing on PhD students? And I completely agree. Um, and so here are some ideas that I'm, I'm thinking about. Because again, this is about a pipeline that starts um, much, more, uh, much earlier on. Um, so sure, let's do something. So this summer, um, excuse me, I should say summer 2021, uh, uh, this summer there's going to be a pilot program that's being sponsored by the Harvard Center for Public Service and Engaged Scholarship. Um, and we're calling it Fellows at the Forefront. So climate change and the environment, social, political, and economic levers for a just transition. And what this is going to do, it's really interesting the way we've set this up, is that we're going to have two groups of undergraduate students. One group of students are going to be uh, research assistants that um, will help on a set of uh, projects that I'm involved in that are about um, you know, how do we have a, a transition um, that is equitable and fair to all parties involved. Um, but a second group of students are going to embed in climate-related public service organizations. So like really getting a set of students to go out into the field and to experience what does on-the-ground work around climate change um, look like now, okay? Um, and so we'll also have then opportunities for those groups of students to come back together and share perspectives from a more research angle versus a perspective from a more engaged scholarship type angle. And so that's really exciting. Um, and then finally, I'm really excited um, to be designing the course with my colleague, Stephen Saliba here, who's a preeminent scholar of American politics entitled The Politics of Climate Change and the Environment. Um, and this will be uh, uh, the government department's, I think the first big lecture oriented course uh, on, on the envir environment and climate um, that it's offered. And so we're thinking about the entire pipeline. And again, my thanks to the Weatherhead Center for um, helping us kick this project off. And I'll stop there. It is us who thank you, uh, Dustin. This is such important work. And we know also the demand among students, the eagerness to get involved in this kind of research. So we really have the obligation to, to respond to this and to work with them on, on the issues. So thank you. Now we're gonna turn to um, uh, Bob Cohen for a few comments. He will react to the presentation and add uh, information that hasn't been uh, discussed yet. Uh, if, uh, are you ready? Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, here I am. Uh, so uh, I'm involved in. Uh, I'm hearing a. I'm I'm hearing a, a feedback. Is that a problem? Do you, how do you hear that? Is that yeah, better? There is, there is some echo, but there's no yeah. echo when I speak. There's. A okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm involved in both the projects uh, that are that are involved in this session. Uh, it is it is still a feedback for me. I, I, I don't know why it's making noise. I mean, I, I can't. I can hear myself a second later. Um, Bob, I think you have two screens up. Can you see if you are you are you on the screen twice? No. 
I'm not. Um, not that I can Bob, see. I, Bob, I see you twice there. Oh, okay. Well. Now it's fixed. You're all set, Bob. Okay, now it's fixed. Thank you. So uh, I'm involved in both the projects being discussed in this session, and, and I'm not going to talk for 15 minutes because when I come on one of these sessions as as member of the audience, I want to ask questions and not just just listen. So uh, these these have been great uh, presentations. I would say a word about the pipeline project that Dustin's involved in, and then a little bit of a maybe a maybe a critical word and and some questions about the sustainability science project, which I've been involved in somewhat as well. Uh, in, in the last six years, I've been trying to persuade political scientists to work on climate change. Uh, and it uh, was slow going at first. There was, in 2015, virtually nobody in the field uh, working on climate change. It's changed a lot. We now have about 20 or 25 people, Dustin, one of them, who are doing very good work on climate change, mostly, mostly young political scientists under the age of 45. Uh, and they're mostly people who did not get their PhDs working on climate change issues. So they transferred to this field because they saw the opportunities. They saw it was a field which uh, has lots of very important policy problems, a lot of um, intellectual puzzles uh, uh, that are important for political scientists and very few people working in it. So it's a terrific opportunity. And this is what uh, other political scientists should see and, and what we hope graduate students will see. So now we're trying to move that down, having at least made a lot of progress on people who are in their thirties and who are active political scientists work, work it down to graduate students and get them persuaded. They're, they're a little slower to, to make the move, partly because they follow too much their senior faculty advisors and these people are not doing climate change. Um, on, on sustainability science, I'm a good friend of the old captain for a long time and I'm fascinated by the ideas. But I wanna comment on an ambiguity that I see at the heart of sustainability science. And that ambiguity is which capabilities or which capacities that, that Alicia talked about uh, on which sustainability uh, science focuses can be created by science and which capacities are only uh, created by, by politics, political processes. I was involved in the National Academy uh, uh, seminar with, the, with those six capacities. In December, I thought this ambiguity was a real problem for all but, all but the measurement one. That is in every case, uh, the, the capacity could only be created by a political process that has the capacity for equity, capacity to adapt, capacity to transform, the capacity to link knowledge with action. All four of those capacities all involve governance. They, they all involve politics. They all involve distributional questions. Uh, who, has to, who has to adapt? Uh, what does equity mean? Who gets resources? Who gets what, when, and how? That's Laswell's political science question. Uh, and yet they were, they're often treated and they were in, the, in these seminars often as if they were capacities that sustainability science could create. And I believe that's a fundamental mistake. And so what I wanna do is challenge my friends to say, well, what's your answer to that question? Uh, why, why do you think that sustainability science can create these capacities when they all accept the measurement one, arguably it too, but it's less so, um, have to be created by a political process which involves interests, involves power, uh, involves uh, people seeking excess advantage for themselves, people not seeking equity but seeking gain uh, in, one, in one dimension or another. Uh, how do we think about sustainability science uh, as creating uh, capacities that can only be created by politics? That's the question I want to uh, pose to Bill and, and Alicia and Kyle. Thank you. This is wonderful, thank you. Thank you for starting the conversation. So I want to invite now the panelists to turn on their videos so we can have a little bit of an exchange. And uh, maybe we can ask uh, Bill and Alicia to uh, answer the question that uh, Bob uh, asked. Is this just, what's the power of knowledge and science in creating these capabilities that are needed? in uh, how is our ability to change limited by the power dynamics at hand? Sure. Uh, Bill, do you mind if I- Oh, please go, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, Bob and I have failed to convince each other of the answer to this question for nigh on 40 years. So Maybe you can succeed. <laughs> you okay. get a good shot first. <laughs> so I'd, I'd start by completely agreeing with you that sustainability science as a research field 
has a very limited capacity of our own to uh, change how things are done out there in the world to actually make these changes. And I don't think that we, I don't think I don't think anyone in sustainability science community has the delusion that alone uh, we can make these changes. Our argument is more of a scholarship and empirical one that we need capacities as a society to be able to do these things, specifically to overcome a lot of what you're talking about, incumbent interests, powerful political dynamics. So the capacities aren't supposed to somehow emerge magically out of sustainability science and then everyone just uses them. I think what research can do, whether it's done in sustainability science or in political science and you know, sustainability science is as a broad tint of researchers interested in fostering sustainability, but coming out of a huge number of disciplines, but in identifying, well, what, what do we need in order to be able to pursue sustainability? And what can research at least up until this point, whether it's conducted by a political scientist, by natural scientists, by economists, by anthropologists, sociologists, what can those researchers say about what what we know about that capacity, what 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 does it take to build it? What does it take? What are the sort of pitfalls of that kind of work, and uh, what what needs to be done moving forward? But I don't think that anyone thinks that uh, we can do this alone. Uh, but I think looking at the recent pandemic, uh, not the one we're still living through today, um, it was really clear, at least in the U.S., that that we really failed on a huge number of these capacities, whether it was the capacity early on to measure what was happening with the, with the pandemic or to be able to adapt quickly to it, uh, that, that these capacities are needed not just for the pursuit of sustainability, but overall in our ability to govern well. That's my take, Bill. Um, <clears throat> our colleague Amartya Sen has a lovely phrase. Uh, which is informed agitation. And uh, we have been very much guided by it. In fact, I, I have just sent to the, I've just posted on the uh, chat group, which I can't get to the full audience, I think, but to the chat group, a quote from our review, which says, all of these changes have to be led by political agitation. You know, breaking the power monopolies that are out there uh, dislodging the people whose interests are perpetuating what we're in. That is the name of sustainability transformation. Can't do anything without it. The role of science is secondary to the political activism, but political activism is a scarce resource. And far too often, we academics have left the frontline activists without the benefit of things we can gain by carefully studying past successes and failures, taking advantage of the luxury we have to sit here at Harvard, uh, not out on the front lines, to assess uh, what are the constituents of success and failure. And so the challenge here is for us to serve the frontline agitators by bringing to them the best information, the best weaponry uh, that uh, we as scholars can create for them. Um, the review we wrote was targeted to the researchers to help them learn how to do that more effectively. Uh, the Academy workshop you participated in was expressly to say, we've had thousands of meetings and workshops with activists telling each other what action to take. Um, some of it hugely effective and important. It had been 20 years in this country not so long in Sweden because Carl's there, 20 years since the scholarly community had come together and said, not just within uh, Dustin's uh, reincarnated political science, but across the disciplines that contribute to this venture, what have we learned? What do we know? What don't we know? And what is it, looking ahead to Carl's symposium, Nobel symposium coming up in a month or two, what is it of all that stuff that we should bring forward to the front lines of agitation. Okay, Bill, here's the, here's the issue that you and I have discussed, and I'll make the point. There's a strong tradition in, sci in science that, known as positivism, which separates science from agitation, which makes the claim that for science to be viewed as credible and, and legitimate, 
by people with a wide variety of political views. It has to be separate from agitation and not linked to it. The seminars in December did not follow that pattern. It was sometimes hard to tell whether a given presentation was science or agitation. Is that something you're happy to accept, the merger between science and, ag and agitation? Or if not, what's the, what's the line you want to draw? What, how do you make, oh, make the distinction? Uh, that this, this, this shouldn't be this hard. Um, if I'm a health scientist working on a really important health problem, I'm not indifferent to what experiment I go into the lab tomorrow morning to do. I'm picking either the one that will earn me the most money or the one that will address the worst unaddressed disease that's out there killing people around the world. So first of all, I have a normatively politically infested agenda in the problems I pick to do. Of course, do. We, are. we all do. Okay, yeah. that's number one. Then when I sort through what problems to ask, I'll take a piece out of my own record, looking at upland logging and farming in the tropics upstream of cities and hydroelectric plants. Um, the only only research being funded was being funded by the hydroelectric operators and the downstream uh, cities in which they said, go study the, the runoff and erosion caused by these illegal upland farmers um, in order that we can document how much it's damaging us and what legislation should take place. Um, that was the only research being funded. Fortunately, in this case, in the International Agricultural Research Centers, some people hid under the leaf of, of we don't call the normative shots and said, well, wait, somebody's got to go work with these Upland Hill people to actually do the research on whether they or something else, like the fact that they're volcanic soils, is responsible for all the runoff. It doesn't change how you read the data at the end it changes radically who gets to ask the questions. I'm certainly, I'm, cer I'm certainly with that. It wasn't always the case at the seminars in December. Um, it wasn't, you guys picked the speakers. <laughs> I just picked the chairs. <laughs> so we have- You're right, you're right though, of course. And I don't want to pretend that this is not a delicate area. You and I would disagree a little bit on what makes expertise or knowledge, something that people would bet the lives of their family or their firm on. I think it's a little more than positivism. And I think we have been careless in deciding which kind of knowledge counts and which doesn't. Um, but it's a gray area that always should be debated. Any research team should be debating this all the time with itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a sociologist of knowledge, I would ask also that uh, there's a much greater acknowledgement now, I think, than there was 40 years ago that all knowledge is political. And I think all parties that are involved in these debates are now acutely aware of this. So we have also a political system with massive amount of money invested in lobbying in around natural resources, agriculture, et cetera. So the, the power set up in DC really would need a major overall. And it's very hard to understand how this could happen uh, politically unless you know, the major parties get deeply invested in this. So uh, I thought I would throw in one question before we open uh, this to, uh, we had several uh, colleagues like Catherine Sicking and others who've, who are, have been posting questions. So the one question I want to ask before we open this up is, do you as experts think that the Green New Deal will be a, a way forward given that so many uh, people are now deeply invested in it politically in part because it's been carried by a, a you know, the Democratic Socialist of America, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, I mean, is it viewed as too radical for it to have leg and where will it to bring us? So would one of you like to so, take- So I'll come in as, as a political scientist. I think the Biden administration's response to it is very uh, clear. That is, they're inspired by it, but they're, but they're not following it. Uh, yeah. They are- following a more establishment agenda, a more infrastructure agenda, which is not as encompassing as the, as the Green New Deal. 
So I, I don't think it's going to, I don't think the Green New Deal is a program that is going to be implemented. It's going to be hard enough to implement the Biden program with a, with a kind of narrowness. So there's a certain uh, naivete uh, on, on the left, which, which thought it was going to win the election big, didn't win the election. Uh, narrowly, the center left won the election. And so the left's going to have to realize that they're going to have to settle for a lot less than the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. right, uh, oh, for better, for worse. Yeah, okay. yeah I'd, I'd wait. I'd wait in there just very briefly, and and um, you know, note that you you might see uh, certain regions of the United States have greater elements of what look like the Green New Deal than others, right? So if you think about um, parts of Appalachia and whatnot, you might see a little bit more of that flavor of investment, in part due to political calculations involving very important senators. Right. So sometimes we think about the Green New Deal as just only being like a national thing, but you could have flavors of it that might be more targeted. So that's one point. I think the second point, which, um, you know, the Green New Deal um, uh, uh, didn't think as much about the regulatory state and the stickiness that baking things into regulations can have over time, which I see to be extremely important because otherwise you're just going to have the same type of whiplash. One administration comes in, another administration comes in, mm -hmm. tries to reverse everything, so on and so forth. And so I, I suspect that you might get the for, sort of foundations of things that are more Green New Deal-esque, but permeated through um, other types of uh, maneuvering, especially on the, on the regulatory side, that can have then longer um, term effects. So just a prediction there. Thank you. Alicia? Yeah, I just I think it's important to remember that the kind of document that everyone refers to as the Green New Deal uh, that that AOC and uh, Senator Markey put forward is really brief. It's not it's not a huge amount of how do we do this, how do we bake this into our uh, laws, but it's it's more of a vision, and I think that's important to keep in mind that it is it a vision that has impacted not just at the the highest levels of federal policy in the Biden administration, but that people, as, as Dustin was alluding to, across levels of government, formal government, but also sort of NGO and social organization have grasped onto and has redefined how people talk about what we're trying to do and talk about the need for transformational change. Mm -hmm. and, and this ability to then get together, whether it's in groups in Appalachia, thinking about how do we restructure our agricultural systems uh, to, to much more formal government policies to redefine how do we imagine a very different kind of future for ourselves uh, that confronts a lot of the challenges that we face uh, is really important. So I think that Green New Deal or the language around it, whether it comes from the sort of very specific policy or not, has, has massively shifted how we talk about uh, sustainability in the country. I think Carl's going to point out how, how US centric we are, given the Europeans. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not, but I'm, but I'm uh, I like uh, Michel learned a concept called cultural repertoires, which I like a lot, uh, which is connected to uh, the imaginations that Alicia just talked about. And, and I think we are Personally, I think we are in a really exciting moment on earth right now in the sense that we are moving out of the industrial era uh, into, into something that is not completely defined yet. But, uh, and, and I guess you're a little bit behind it to some extent, actually, Bob, if you say the eurocentric, uh, because a lot of these shifts are happening very fast in, in Europe and in my country, and especially in business sectors. And uh, remember last week you had Larry Flink coming out with pretty big statements from BlackRock and these type of things. So, so there, are, there are new things under the sun here for, for us as uh, scientists. And that connects to your question about uh, uh, the role of science, of course. And, and uh, in my mind, what I think is, is exciting with sustainability science is the, is the sort of the, a lot, a lot of new, very interesting experiments going on in transdisciplinary science, actually, where you could co co produce competence with other knowledge systems, and and uh, my experience with that is that if you if you bring up in an honest way the the best understanding we can deliver right now on a certain topic, uh, then that immediately frames also the different pathways for for action. That's been a very surprising thing for me actually when I work with these big companies that they are that uh, you you can remove a lot of really. Uh, 
that with that you knew are com completely devastating, actually, uh, and mindsets. And you can also change, change and contribute by just providing the best science we can deliver right now. That may change, look different in a few years, but to be honest about it and, 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 and directly confront, confront the complexity and uncertainty that we are, that we are, are, are uh, living with. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I, 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 when you talk about the political science challenge and the economic science, I, it's a, it's an ongoing story, and I think it's quite depressing that our university systems are still so inflexible to to not being able to to mobilize and, and, and master sort of the, the best capacities or understanding we have in 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 the university system to collaborate more strongly. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, well, let me say that I, I, I share your optimism. I've never been more optimistic uh, uh, about the politics than the last month. Uh, right. and, and not just because of the Biden administration, also the BlackRock issue, as you said, there's a big, big turn even in the US, which you wouldn't have thought it would, it, it would come so fast in, in, in corporate behavior because mm -hmm. markets look ahead and they can see what's down the road in 2040 and 2050, partly because of all the, all the work on that, on, on climate change. And they know they have to plan for that. Uh, whereas politicians often do, never look ahead 30 years. There's no, no percentage in it, but the markets are, and that's, that's very important as, as well as the political shifts, which we're seeing. So I'm quite optimistic. And I think yeah, what, what, the science uh, uh, helps. What we see in our work is that before you have bigger uh, tipping points or regime shift, uh, variance increases uh, enormously. <laughs> And, and there's no doubt that that's the case, at least uh, in value systems and, and, uh, and uh, behaviors uh, right now, mm -hmm. uh, all over the place, I think, actually. But of course, as we all know, it can, it can go into really bad situations also. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I personally think we have a, not, not much more than we have a true responsibility as, as, as providing the best understanding in this situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, remember, I show, I show that window of opportunity. It's, it's, a, it's a window of opportunity or, or, or this opportunity right now. Mm -hmm. And if we hide away from it, I think that's really, really bad. And, and, and I would say that that's a normative and moral statement from, a, from my perspective. And, and I think it's sad to hear, to understand how little different disciplines are connecting actively in these situations, which you could call a quite emergence situations for our whole civilization, actually. We, we've never been beyond two degrees the last three million years, for example. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the last 11,000 years has been stable for us and, and we've, we're already out of that. So, so it's going to be turbulent and, and we need to really figure out the best collaborative collective action processes that we ever can muster in this situation. But, but don't be depressed about it. I mean, in, in fact, the situation was terrible six years ago. It's dramatically different in political science now. And with people like Dustin, it's going to be dramatically different in five years. With, with new graduate students. So I mean, actually we're seeing from a much too low a start, we're seeing actually quite a, quite a rapid shift. Um, uh, and, and, and we're even seeing this work getting into the so-called top journals, which were excluding it until a couple of years ago as, as applied work. So I, I think we're seeing a rapid, rapid shift, although it's too little, but it's, it's, it's moving fast from a very low base. And I would say that the same is true in sociology where some of the major prize winning books are books about the environment. Uh, and just to reinforce what you were saying, Bob, about the corporate sector, we have to remember the movement of the B Lab and B Corps to certify corporations as, uh, or, you know, attentive to sustainability. It's a major movement, and the push toward creating more inclusive capitalism, the movement to, you know, rejuvenate capitalism is very, very significant with the focus on shareholder capitalism. So it's quite possible that the nudging of the political sector will, uh, by the business sector, will finally have uh, an impact. So um, I want to turn to some of the questions that have been posted because they're quite interesting. So Catherine Sicking, whose name has already been mentioned by, by uh, Dustin, I think she's part of the team with which he works, a wonderful uh, colleague in the Kennedy School. She says, following a uh, following up on Bill Clark's point that academics should bring the best research to the activists, so on a specific important issue currently facing the executive committee of the Weatherhead Center, we had a meeting yesterday, that of divestment of fossil fuel, is there are uh, there are any good research about whether divestment works and which kinds of 
uh, divestment would be most effective. So our discussion when we met yesterday was, should we target coal in particular? Should, what kind of pressure should we try to um, exert on the funders of the Weatherhead Center? And the broader question is, of course, what's happening at Harvard concerning divestment? Uh, Bill, do you want to answer that since you're in the middle of the debates about this? No. No? no. <laughs> you don't want um, to, to speak to be found guilty? <laughs> I think um, I, I would uh, sort of pump this back to, uh, to uh, Bob Cohan's court. Um, as Catherine knows, um, I think the um, divestment argument is one in which the ideology of the wording has run so far ahead mm -hmm. of either a precise statement of what it is one is trying to accomplish with it or an analysis of even what success would mean. Mm -hmm. uh, remind folks that when Harvard uh, chose to block most investments in apartheid South Africa, there was a very specific objective in mind. And there was a precise measure of when you would remove the ban. You drop apartheid, we start reinvesting. Okay? It, very, very bright and clear. Um, tobacco wasn't quite as clear, but it was clear. It was clearer than the divestment one is right now. Divestment, you say, well, you mean we should stop investing in anything that has to do with fossil fuels while we continue to use fossil fuels? Oh, well, success would mean that everybody else stops using fossil fuels. Hmm? Success would mean that the fossil fuel primary producers go bankrupt. I mean, leave aside the feasibility of it, but that's the goal. That can't possibly be tomorrow morning that they go bankrupt. Um, no, so I think it is an ill-posed question and what we should be doing for sure is pushing back on the administration's longstanding policy not to let the allocation of its investment resources be part of its strategy of Harvard's impact on the world. I am totally behind that, mm -hmm. but we need to be precise about it mm -hmm. and then wherever we come out, we need to insist in transparency in the metrics. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, of the ones I've looked at, the institutions that with the best of intentions have declared themselves to be divesting, I will argue that not one person in a thousand in that institutions knows either even what they thought they were divesting from or what in fact they have divested from. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I have refused to sign on to the movement for divestment at that level of specificity. I'd be happy to sign on to a movement to throw Exxon to the wolves, but over their opposition to truth rather than their mining of fossil fuels. Mm. That's a very interesting position. So, uh, Dustin may know of research on this. I don't think there is, uh, and Catherine may know of it more than and the rest of us, I think, Bill, you're entirely right to ask the, us to say, what are what is the goal here? And my instinct to say that the goal is to stop investments in new fossil fuel sources. Uh, you can't, you, as you say, we can't keep. I filled up my car with gas today, my my hybrid, right? Uh, I can't say, oh, oh, close down Shell because because <laughs> that's absurd. However, I could say to Shell. There's no reason for you to, to explore for any more fossil fuel resources. Uh, the consequence of that would be, of course, to raise the price of fossil fuels, which is good from the point of view of reducing demand. Um, and uh, and, and all, also will mean that it, it would not be profitable to, to drill. You'd have a whole set of whole industry of drilling for fossil fuels, uh, creating new capacity uh, that would stop. And, that capacity, it's a problem because once a, a company has built that capacity, they have to amortize it. They borrow money for it. They have, they have to use it. That's the focus I would have. I would focus kind of laser-like on no new production of oil, at, at least, and coal. Uh, natural gas, of course, is, a compl is more complex because it's, it's a transition fuel. And we're still arguing about whether it's good to use natural gas in the next 10 years to, to substitute for coal or not. But I think it, you could focus on, on oil and, um, and coal and say, 
no, no investment in firms that are investing in new capacity. I don't know what Dustin likes about that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, weigh, in here brief, I'll weigh in here briefly. Um, Catherine, I, I'm, I'm frankly not aware of what I would consider to be credible research on the topic, and I have looked, um, and I use the word credible. There are people that have put out positions, but it's more, as uh, Bill is noting, uh, ideological rather than rigorous from a social science perspective. Um, you know, I, I'd say the thing that I've um, sort of laid out at times is that uh, in, uh, in any such move like divestment, we have to be mindful of the knock-on effects that uh, happen for people who, what I would say are simply not at fault, mm -hmm. right? Um, the apartheid regime was very precisely targeted and um, the people who were perpetuating that regime were the most directly hit, right? And that's great. I like that. Um, but, you know, I grew up in tobacco country in North Carolina when all that was going on. I was remarking in a, in a talk yesterday, I, I, I took a class trip. My first trip to a manufacturing plant was, a toba uh, it was an RJ Reynolds plant. And it was absolutely fascinating, right? Um, but, you know, this was the livelihood of many, many, many people. Um, and the same thing for, you know, other regions that are still employment dependent, less so on, on poll for sure. It's still there, Montana, parts of West Virginia, but natural gas. I mean, you know, we talk to people on the Louisiana coast and they're like, what do you mean you're going to try to take this away from us? This is our future. And, and that's not the, the sort of corporate barons. That's just regular folks. And so we, we just have to in any scheme that we come up with, I completely endorse Bill's perspective of what's the target, how will we know when we have success? But I think another uh, normative criterion is how targeted, how targeted it is on those who are perpetuating some misdeed. And you know the, the truthfulness, the sort of the lying um, that uh, some in the fossil fuel industry, not all, have done um, is one such criterion. But how do you how do you target things in, in, in international relations? We think about how targeted can you make sanctions, right? Otherwise, you just have a lot of perverse effects that could actually undo the support for your institution to begin with. So we just have to be very careful and think through those externalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Michelle, could I just jump in quickly? Sure. Uh, I <laughs> I agree both with D Dustin and with Bill in that first we need any actual policy that Harvard implements or anyone implements to be very clearly defined with goals in mind and looking at sort of the potential equity externalities of any of them. But I think what the divestment community is asking for is less about the exact policy which policy wonks like us should help craft and more for this normative line in the sand to be drawn by Harvard to take away, to say, you know, specific practices around fossil fuels and especially the big companies that have you know lied as as you point out to continue with sort of our highly carbonized economies up until the, really the breaking point we need to be able to draw a line in the sand and say we're taking away their social license to operate they have the, the way they have been operating so mm -hmm. i think there's a place between these two sides. One is that we do make a strong statement, but that's very specific on these policies. So maybe just as Bob said, it's around not investing in future extraction, or as you said earlier, Bill, it's around not investing in companies that lie. But I think what people really want is just this announcement to say, this is our plan because what we have been doing is morally unconscionable for future generations. Mm -hmm. Uh, Valerie Nelson has added a note saying Harvard faculty voted for an ambitious decarbonization goal for the endowment, which recognizes the complexity of finance and climate change. They do not speak only stocks in uh, fossil fuel. They know that there's carbon use in steel, agriculture, transportation, etc. Many people are working on how to achieve carbon reduction through financial pressures. So anyway. Uh, Carl, did you want to add anything to this conversation around uh, our parochial issues? A, a nice example of adaptation versus transformation, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and as uh, you know, as Southern oh. California is burning more and more, you know, I think the level of awareness and of the complexity is really 
heightened. So uh, we have planned to end now. Um, maybe I'll just ask one more question and then we'll conclude. So Aram Satar asked to Dustin, I teach in a sustainability water management program and I just want to pick up on the disconnect between where the students are, immense pool of energy, and the careers they envisage having in the puddling, sorry, the plodding nature of academic programs that are too slow to respond to creating truly interdisciplinary programs across departments that the students want. On pipelines, as we know, there are an immense number of students who get master's degree as their final degrees and don't have any intention of going on to get doctoral degrees. So what do we need to do better within universities to help train these future actors? And I will just add, we know that these programs are exploding, attracting so many students, but the jobs are hard to get. So what do we do with this? So let me, um, you know, what, I've kind of approached some of this through the lens of political science. You know, you got to start somewhere. But, um, you know, Bill and I sit on the board of tutors for the environmental science and public policy program, which is frankly something that the university, I, you know, I would advocate for the university investing quite a bit more in, um, in light of the fact that it is, it's cutting across, you know, um, Catherine, you made this comment of getting the natural sciences into all of this more directly. You've got people like Bill and others coming in from the public policy type perspective. It's an opportunity. Um, at that at that level, and it, it you know it's in some senses a manifestation of that type of interdisciplinary work that is necessary, but it's hard to do. I mean, we're kind of a ragtag group, I got to say, right? Um, and we do it just you know um, by our bootstraps, um, even though it's you know it means something to a, a lot of us. You know, I think the other just on the other side, on the employment side, um, that that dimension is getting better, from what I can tell. Right. It's changing and it's changing for all the reasons that folks like Carl and others were, were speaking to, which now you have companies that have to have people in place that can do things that are related to how are they going to make a transition in the next 20 years. And so that landscape has actually changed very rapidly, at least in my sort of anecdotal view. And it looks like Bill and Carl are shaking their heads. So, you know, if, if I were to you know, advise a young student that's passionate. Don't look, don't worry about going and getting the PhD. That's not for everyone. It's okay. Get mm. the education you need, go out there, get some skills, um, go out there in the world and make an impact. And there are a range of companies, not just sort of nonprofits. There are a range of companies that are hiring in these areas now because they have to, and that's great. Yeah, they are mandated too. That makes a big difference. Okay. Okay, so maybe uh, the last thing, one more thing. Bill has a question for Dustin before we close off. So do you want to ask your question, Thanks. Bill? Um, just an observation, Dustin. I am delighted with what you're doing in political science. Um, let's presume you're successful. Um, we then, it, we have one of two outcomes. Either this is gonna be a real problem because political science will take over sustainability studies uh, like economics almost has from the social science side. And um, despite the fact that the economists have contributed a huge amount to where we are today, they still are almost without exception. You know, Pratha Dasgupta being an exception, just unwilling to talk to anybody else. So the, the curious thing to me is that um, you referred to the Environmental Science Public Policy Program. Alicia and I co-teach in it, a course in sustainable development, which we get students from neurophysiology, economics, political science, so on and so forth. So they come together. At the other end, I gave up on PhD programs for this years ago because I couldn't solve your problem, but ran for the last 10 years, this sustainability science fellows program, which was taking advanced level PhD students and postdocs and practitioners and bringing them together for a year, basically a kind of thing I learned from Bob years back to interact with one another on joint projects, on joint seminars and so on, not because I had given up on turning them into sustainability science PhDs or whatever that would mean, but rather that they learned to cross fertilize what each other had to bring to these problems. And I find it utterly bizarre that mm -hmm. we've got, and, and we, every year we had you know, 150 applications of good people who were qualified for the 15 slots we, had, we could fund. Um, so we've got undergraduates who want to do this coming together. We have got, postdocs and graduates of PhD programs who want to do this. And the dead space is in the PhD programs. Mm -hmm. So 
so first, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing, but it's it obviously raises a bigger problem that you now live in in your in your beyond political science professor mode of what on earth is wrong with the way we're thinking about PhD scholarship today and getting the certificate and so on that could lead to that crazy hourglass shaped arrangement of being willing and able to grapple with the complexity of the problems the way they lie instead of silo by silo. Mm -hmm. so, so Bill, be, uh, before Dustin gives a good response, you don't have to worry about political science being like economics. We're too weak, we're too diverse, and we're too self-critical. Okay. Economics so you is none, of, is none of those things. So I, you will I, I not become a, my I, nightmare. I was, I was at one of Simon Levin's complexity seminars two years ago, and somebody showed some scientists from uh, 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 from Santa Fe showed up one of these network maps, and science looked like a spaghetti ball. You couldn't tell who was the chemist, who was the biologist. The only outliers were the economists. They were all grouped. They only cited each other. It was a a, a citation network. They cited one another, and nobody cited them, and it was just dramatic. Mm -hmm. So I think well, your, your sense but, is shared. But Bob, you just need to get allied with sociology. It will go much better. <laughs> or you run something like Carl's Bayer Institute, which selectively brings together the economists who do want to collaborate and mm -hmm. makes it easy for them to bump up against the very best natural scientists and other players in the arena. Uh, and my view, Carl, is you haven't had problems filling the slots at Bayer. No, we haven't, but we also started something called the Bayer Young Scholars, where we are actively through the networks of really top scholars we have, identifying the key young people coming up who are interested in these areas and then bring them together during three years, uh, at, at least a couple of times, and then they start projects. So for example, now, uh, one of the groups have a project on inequality in the biosphere, as, uh, as Michelle have heard about before, and, and actually that connection didn't exist in the literature Mm -hmm. uh, in any way, uh, if you go back five, six years, actually. Exactly. They, they, even, they even got the big grant from uh, one of the Swedish competitive, very competitive research councils for mm -hmm. doing that, actually, now uh, three, four years into the future. So mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think we have to be much more innovative of how we plant the seeds for these type of col collaborations and, and stop being trapped by the career paths and, and create new ones. And having planted the seeds, not then kill off the sprouts <laughs> the moment they enter a PhD program and are told, no, you can't do that because you won't get through your RLs. Ah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, I, I'd point to a, a couple of things. Um, I think in our PhD programs, um, we, uh, we romanticize the quote unquote canon perhaps a little bit too much. <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, all right, maybe I should have read after hegemony, but did I really? No, I'm just kidding, Bob. You didn't really uh, need to. No, I'm <laughs> right. <You're> absolutely right. <laughs> you know, and 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 as a result, as a as a result, um, uh, people know literatures, but they don't know the world. Mm -hmm. That and, is true. And and right. how you know? I, I don't know how to. I mean, you know, one one thing that I've enjoyed participating in um, are. Uh, where you you get groups of people together that the, there's a, a project that Ernie Moniz is directing um, that I'm I'm part of the Roosevelt project and it brings together you know Jason Beckfield in sociology is part of it I'm part of it uh, we have economists we have urban planning design type people um, and you know it's 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 project based learning rather than class based learning and mm -hmm. you know to me um, not only is that sort of a kind of a not only do, do am I learning more because of that, but I think students that our students that are participating are learning more because of that. And then finally, it makes them better prepared to if at the point they might apply to a Carl's program or apply to Bill's program, they can embed in a way um, that makes them much more versatile and much more useful to a broader team. Um, and you know, and our hope is that for the work that we'll do in political science, we can draw on networks like are on this call. So say, hey, like we got you network in political science, but hey, like here's a big problem that you as a political scientist on your own can't solve. You need to go out and embed somewhere else. Now, how you get the professional incentives right, because, you know, oh, I, a publication in Journal X doesn't matter. Um, well, I don't know. I just went on Google Scholar and saw that Carl's cited 116,000 times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I mean, we want to talk about incentives? 
right? So, you know, I, I think there are opportunities, but, you know, it, it will be a challenge. And I think we're starting what we're doing and mm-hmm. hopefully it can, you know, sprout out and let's not kill those sprouts. Yeah, and I would add that the interdependence that we experience as people involved in interdisciplinary project teaches us that there are topics that can only be solved through interaction. So for instance, the literature on the interaction between the micro, meso, and macro in sociology is huge and extremely developed. So I know from my interactions with Carl, that's exactly what brought us together, that you know his study of resilience could benefit from the kind of work that the Successful Society Project had done, just as we really improve our, de- our understanding of resilience through the interaction. So this I think mutual interdependency is just crucial to uh, the production of new knowledge and that's the reality of it, so. Okay, well, um, you know, there are still uh, questions on our chat and I've asked Sarah Bantz to share it with the, uh, uh, the participants so that you can get more food for, you know, food for thought. So I want to thank you all for taking time to do this. I mean, I found the exchange super engaging and uh, we know that there was at the same time another event running at the Kennedy School on the Biden approach uh, to sustainability. Uh, The timing was not ideal, but nevertheless, I think we all learned a lot. And I want to in particular thank the amazing staff of the Weatherhead Center. These events have been running seamlessly they're just amazing the communication team sarah bands our event uh, coordinator so thank you for being part of this and i hope the conversation will continue and good luck with every to everyone about, with your various project and with the uh, ending covid very soon it's on you <laughs> well thank you michelle for the initiative yep. and for leadership for thank you very much indeed okay i look yeah. forward to seeing you all in person one day soon, soon hopefully Bye. Thank you.